Shane, thank you so much for taking some time to link up with us today. How are you doing? Man, we're doing great. It's really great to, to talk to you, Levi, and uh, talk to Fresh Life. So I'm glad, glad we can do this today. Well, on behalf of everybody at Fresh Life and our online family and everyone joining in, thank you for taking time out of a very busy schedule up there. Uh, and to everyone at NASA, we're so grateful for facilitating this and letting us just have a moment to get a, a peek into your life there on the International Space Station. Yeah, um, huge thanks to the ground team. I know they've been working with your team, and uh, we're, we're glad to do this, and uh, we want to welcome you all to the International Space Station. My gosh. So we're in a series, as you know, called Look Up, talking about the power of hope in hard times, and I thought it would be appropriate to literally look up because there you are in the space station above us, 250 miles uh, going around the planet once every 90 or, or so minutes. What I just can't even fathom that it's just incredible yeah we're we're in a pretty special place obviously um just getting the incredible view we have of planet earth is just out of control and then when you look the other way look into deep space and you see the billions and billions of stars out there it's just it's just mind-blowing i mean it really is it's really a special place to be now shane uh of course i have to say this because you're in space and you're flying around in microgravity uh, is there any way you could do a flip for us? Because you're wearing that fresh shirt, and just to see you uh, do, do a flip, just the boy in me has to ask. Oh, my gosh. Incredible. Thank you so much. I just had to channel my inner, you know, lost boy and ask you to be Peter Pan for just a quick minute because that is your daily life up there. My pleasure. Glad to do it. Now, Shane, uh, when we were with you last, we were, of course, separated from glass and with your family at a distance because like the world has discovered in these last couple of years, quarantine is important when there's a disease. But for NASA, that's been a way of life for a very long time, going all the way back to the Apollo program. program there was quarantines before launches. So, I mean, that's kind of how you keep uh, the space station free from germs, right? Exactly right. And uh, it's been usually about a two-week quarantine, and that's historically the way we've done it to make sure, again, that we're staying away from the general public and we don't you know, get sick or, or take anything with us that uh, once we get up here in a very closed environment, uh, if somebody's sick, everybody's gonna get sick. So we have been doing this quarantine process, like you said, ever since the Apollo days, and it's been very effective um, to maintain health and stabilization up here on the space station. And for Jenny and I and my kids who were on the beach in Cocoa Beach, uh, that day watching you launch April 17th, we had been looking forward to for so long but honestly, even though I was four point some miles away at the viewing area, I was devastated emotionally by the experience of that rocket launch. I can only imagine what that was like for you. Uh, is there any way you could put us into your mind as you're lying there on your back on that Falcon 9 rocket in your Dragon capsule and about to, to blast off just what that, what that felt like? Yeah, absolutely incredible. Obviously, that's a, the whole day is uh, an interesting day. As you remember, it was an early morning launch. I think we got up around 10.30 p.m. We were on a weird sleep shift to be able to meet that uh, 6 or so a.m. launch. And uh, maybe about four hours before launch, we walk out of the building in our spacesuits and head to the launch pad. And just prior to that, we get a little special moment with our families. Um, so that was you know kind of an emotional moment. And then we get in, the, in uh, Teslas um, because we're flying with SpaceX, of course and drive to the launch pad. And in, uh, in my Tesla, it was just Megan MacArthur and I, one of my crewmates, um, along with the driver. And uh, the other two crewmates were in the one behind us. And then we got to jam to some music on the way out there and just kind of relieve a little bit of stress maybe that's going on or just enjoy really the moment. Uh, and then we climb in the vehicle, get strapped in about two and a half to three hours before the launch. And those two and a half to three hours, we're doing some work in there with running checklists and getting ready to go, but there's a lot of downtime. so. Uh, we had a lot of fun with each other, played a few games along the way, and then when it was time to go, we were all ready. And uh, once we felt those engines light, there's nine engines on the, the Falcon rocket, uh, we felt those light and uh, super powerful, and it was just incredible. I think we all started smiling and laughing, and uh, shortly after that, we started accelerating, and uh, it took us about nine, nine and a half minutes to get to space. Um, so we went from zero to 17,500 miles an hour in about nine minutes. So that acceleration was incredible to feel, and the power of those rockets uh, was pretty fantastic. Oh, my gosh. 
And the second stage, uh, I remember we talked on the podcast before you went that you had heard the second stage was a, a kick in the pants, which is just a hilarious Frank Sinatra kind of li line. Uh, did, it, did it live up to the, the hype? Yeah, it did. It was, it was pretty special. We, uh, once we hit uh, main engine cutoff from the first stage, you kind of float for a little bit. You're a little bit weightless until that second engine kicks in, a second stage engine kicks in, and it really threw us back in our seats and gave us a nice kick in the pants to accelerate even more. Yeah, I like referring to one million pounds of thrust as a kick in the pants. That is just you to a T, the calm under that kind of intensity. Now, that's been something that you have had a part of your life, and obviously you have the right stuff, uh, but you were an Apache helicopter pilot in Desert Storm. So thank you again for your service in the United States Army on behalf of our whole church and country. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Levi. It was, it's an honor to serve our nation, uh, first in the military and now at NASA. Uh, and really now I'm serving all of humanity, being a part of an international crew up here, and we are doing things for the entire world. So uh, it's a very special thing to, to be able to serve. Amazing. And uh, what I was going to say was having that helicopter war intensity, you know, life and death hanging in the balances, that kind of got bred into you. And then obviously you have that in your personality. But then you flew on the space shuttle back in 2008, and then again on the uh, Russian Soyuz rocket in 2016. So I'm sure it never gets old, but this was a third times a charm kind of a situation. Could you maybe just walk us through a little bit of the difference in flying in the shuttle? Some of uh, those watching have seen the space shuttle launches, maybe on TV or even in person, some watching. And then of course, the, the one that you did from Russia, that was probably a very different experience. And then even maybe, what, how those two compare to this most recent one? Absolutely, yeah. There are three. You know, I've been very fortunate to fly on three different spacecraft. Um, all very different, um, different, you know, in size and in power. The space shuttle was massive, um, true icon. I mean, probably the most complex vehicle ever built by any human, and uh, it's an American vehicle, of course. So very patriotic kind of thing that the amount of thrust there is about seven and a half million pounds of thrust off the launch pad so compare that to the million with spacex so the first couple of minutes on space shuttle on the launch we are rocking and rolling and shaking around like you may see in the movies or would imagine and then uh, once the solid rocket boosters come off and then you're purely accelerating then it gets a little smooth uh, the soyuz launch i would say was um, the tamest of all of them is nice and smooth all the way up and then SpaceX, the rocket was kind of uh, somewhere in between. So we had we had some some big moments of rocking and rolling, but uh, then it was just pure acceleration for a lot of it too. So very different styles of of launch uh, in, in different vehicles in general. Wow. Now, third time, multiple spacewalks, of course, different missions each time. Uh, this last mission, you guys have done. You personally have done two different spacewalks, being out there working on the solar arrays and. Lots of things didn't go right. You had a uh, issue with your suit and uh, kind of had to go back in and come back out again. Nothing was going like the plan was. And then on August 1st, the entire space station had something go wrong when it kind of got into a, a dangerous trajectory and wasn't quite looking good for a little while. How do you remain calm under pressure and not freak out when something like a space suit shuts down for a minute? Yeah, I think a lot of that goes back to my training, like you mentioned earlier, in the military. Um, we're, we're used to, you know, thinking of the worst cases and training for the worst cases, and hopefully those never happen, but we're prepared for them if they do. Our training at NASA really is no different. Um, we train not just in the U.S. at NASA, but at all the space centers around the world, in Europe and in Japan and in Russia as well, with that same kind of intensity and training for the worst case scenario that, uh, that these incredible smart engineers can think of. And then we're ready for those. And so when something like that happened um, in early August up here, when uh, the space station was literally tumbling out of control, our crew got together um, you know, very calmly like we were trained. And then everybody kind of took their role in what they were supposed to be doing. Um, and so I really rely on our training a ton. And I, I did the same thing in the military. And uh, up here, we had the good fortune most of the time of having an incredible ground team in all the mission control centers around the world that are also helping us. Now, during that event in August, we didn't have that luxury for some of the time because um, we were tumbling so fast that the satellites couldn't pick up our antenna, so we couldn't talk to anybody. So we were kind of on our own for a little bit. But that's, again, where the training kicked in. A lot of our personalities kicked in. Um, our crew is, uh, we're no strangers. We've been training together for over a year before we get up here, in, in some cases, two or three years. 
And uh, so we know each other. We know each other's strengths and weaknesses. And uh, we know how to rely on each other in those kind of situations. Incredible. And praise God. I know that was one of only four such events that have ever happened like that in the 20 years that the space station, this flying laboratory has been orbiting our planet. So unbelievable. And we're so grateful you guys are safe. Um, this is an interesting time when it seems like so many different private companies are entering the space sp sphere. Uh, Bezos, people have watched with Blue Origin and, of course, Richard Branson. Could you maybe help uh, those watching kind of understand how different we're talking in the apogee of those two vehicles, how high they get up from the planet versus where you're at in low Earth orbit? Yeah, sure. First of all, we're really excited of, of anybody getting involved in space travel. With all these private companies now, it's really, really incredible for all of the space business. So we're very happy for them. Um, Richard Branson, as you mentioned, flew. Um, he went up to 50 miles, and uh, and I think Bezos just had to outdo him, so he went to 53.2 miles. And to put that in perspective, again, we're about 250 miles above the Earth. Their flights were very short, just a few minutes, uh, in that weightless regi regime before they headed back to planet Earth, uh, where we're up here for you know about 200 days at a time. Um, so very different. Uh, we're not competing with them or anything, but it is a new era of space travel, and we're really excited um, that private citizens now are starting to fly, and hopefully it'll become more available in the next few decades to the common person. Wow. It's not a competition, but you are winning. Um, uh, and I think it's amazing, and, and obviously God bless both of them, and it's just, like you said, the more the merrier and the more people will be able to do it. Um, you've been up there for months. This mission, uh, the plan was over six months. You've already done six months. I, I can't even imagine the man versus himself battles. I know you spend two hours of every single day keeping your body strong, but what do you do uh, to keep yourself mentally strong and just dealing with literally being in a space station for six months uh, plus? Well, first of all, we have an incredible crew up here, so we all get along and we have fun with each other and we make sure we're keeping it light, um, even though we're working really hard all day. Um, so that helps. Um, and then in our free time, our downtime, we have a chance to you know, call our family, call our friends to stay in touch. That definitely helps the mental side. Um, I think you, you need some time away and, and time alone up here. And so our, our sleep stations or our crew quarters are very private. And so those are places you can go literally to get away from everybody else. And it's a very important piece of this. And uh, everybody has kind of different hobbies and things they do up here, whether it's watching a movie or watching TV or reading a book um, or just looking out the window or taking pictures of planet Earth. Um, those kind of things keep our minds going and keep us healthy. And I know you're personally, like I am, a person of faith. Uh, what part has that played in, spiritually speaking, keeping strong while you're, while you're up there? Well, we've got really great connectivity now. I've been able to watch um, several of my favorite pastors um, live sometimes and sometimes recorded. Um, I get things, uh, your, the fresh life and uh, passion um, sent up to me every week. So I get to enjoy you guys. And that's really, really great for me personally, just to stay connected with you for one. And then, you know, hear the good word, um, you know, once or twice a week, which is fantastic. Um, I also have a personal private time devotional every day um, where I, I read through devotionals or, you know, just reading the Bible to me has really been very important to stay grounded for one, to, to, you know, have the right perspective for two, and then to hopefully just be able to shine the light to anybody I get to talk to up here, whether it's my crewmates or Mission Control um, or anybody I'm talking to on a PR event like this. Wow, incredible. Wow. Um, Shane, we have a couple questions that we put uh, on social media and some of our Fresh Life online family put a couple questions. So if it's okay, I'll ask a few of these to you, just kind of lightning round. The first question came from Instagram and it's, <laughs> and I love this, it's so poetic. Is the silence loud? That's the question. I'm just curious. Is the silence loud? Wow. Well, up here, well, inside on the space station, um, it's it's not silent. Um, there's fans and things going, and all the different modules to keep our equipment running. Um, and we have communications with the ground teams all the time coming through our intercom system and our radio system. And of course, we get to chat with everybody, just like you're in an office building or at, at your church. Um, you're, we're chatting with our crewmates just like that. So uh, I think they're meant, they're talking about going outside and the silence out there. Now, thank goodness in our, in our spacesuits, when we do spacewalks, we have communication built into our helmets and our, and our headsets that we can communicate, not with just the ground, but also our other crewmates either in the space station or that are out there with us. Very good. Um, 
I know that you took off in a Tesla, like you said, to the launch pad. This is not from social media. And it said, reduce, reuse, recycle on the license plates of those three Teslas that took you guys to the pad. Uh, I'm curious, even just seeing the earth, seeing how fragile the atmosphere is, this is personally, what, what, what has it changed of your view of the earth from being out there? You know, I get a little bit, um, I think, more this way every time I get the chance to come up here. And it's to, that I, we just have to take care of our planet. It's the only habitable planet that we know of right now. Um, and the perspective we have up here, we can literally see the fragile, thin layer of atmosphere that's protecting everyone down on Earth from living and dying. And so um, it's made me want to be more aware um, in those three words you said. Um, that, that we're on our Teslas are, are very important to, I think, do that and, you know, reducing the carbon footprints and um, just taking care of our planet better because uh, it's the only one we have. So um, I just get that perspective literally every time I look out the window and see that thin layer of atmosphere. So it's very humbling. It's very striking, of course. It's incredibly beautiful, um, but uh, very humbling. Amazing. Shane, you um, called me uh, to, when you got assigned to this crew and asked me if I would uh, want to send something with you on the mission. In addition to the T-shirt you're wearing, the fresh T-shirt, also sent with you uh, a necklace and then the other item. Do you have those with you? I do. They're right here in my hands. They're in little Ziploc bags so that uh, we don't lose them. Um, and uh, everything like this has Velcro on it so that they don't fly away on us. But, uh, yeah, I have them right here. Okay, so the first one's a necklace that has charms for each of my kids that I plan to give them when they... Uh, turn 18 as a gift, and those things have flown in space, which is so special. So Olivia, Daisy, Lennox, and Clover, uh, those are your, your gifts there that have been to space, uh, those charms that you'll get on your own necklaces. But then uh, also in your other bag, uh, Shane, you have a thumb drive that says on it, the last supper on the moon, right? That's it, and uh, it's a full manuscript of, of something that's special to you, I know. Yeah, it was incredible, the God timing of it all, because I had that day you called me, finished a book that was equal parts saving my life in 2020 from losing my mind, and also just something I felt was a, a God-given mission. And I had just finished the most ambitious publishing project of my life, this book all about space and all about the moon and all about NASA and all, all of these. It's, it's equal parts my love letter to the cross for what Jesus has done and love letter to space. And the day I finished the rough draft, you called asking if I could send anything to space. It was just so amazing. Yeah, so honored to have this up here. And uh, it's really, really going to be special for everybody that gets a chance to read it. So here's the official announcement, January 11th. This will be coming out. And thank you again for the part you've played in it. I, I quote you in it. And I have to clear one thing up because I quote you in the book, Shane, talking about the backflip that you guys would do on the space shuttle to make sure that none of the tiles were damaged for reentry. And I said in the book that th that flip happened when you left the station, but Robbie told me she thought the flip happened when you come to the station. So can you clear that up for us? Yeah, it's on the way up to the space station. Uh, we do, once we get near the space station, the space shuttle used to do a backflip, and the crew members on the space station would then be photographing the tiles underneath, and uh, that's how we did that. Okay, so we can fix that before we go to print. Well, thanks again for bringing that up there. One more question from social media, and this question is, how much training did it take for you to be able to be an astronaut? Well, that's a hard one to answer because literally my whole life has trained me at some level to get to this point, at least my professional life, my education. Um, that all prepared me to be an astronaut, uh, being in the Army and the military prepare me to be a competitive candidate for an ast the astronaut program. And then being here, uh, once, I've, once I got here in 2004 as an astronaut, it takes about two years to go through what I call basic astronaut school, um, astronaut candidate school. And so once you get through that, then you're able to be assigned to a mission technically. But usually it takes you know two to six more years after that before you get assigned to a mission. And then once you get assigned to a mission, you usually train about anywhere from one to two and a half years for that specific mission. And so we're always training. We're always learning. Uh, when I get back from this mission, I'll get into another job and I'll still be learning um, and still will train, you know, to prepare for a potential future mission. So we never stop training. And so it's kind of hard to answer your question. There's no like, oh, you need two years and you're good to go. Um, you got to keep learning and getting better and better. Um, so that you can do your job as well as you can or support the others that are getting ready to go fly in space, all your buddies. So the training never stops. Uh, amazing. Well, Shane, I'm really excited uh, to ask to join with me out here um, on the stage, someone very special to you. 
uh, your wife, Robbie Kimbrough, who we wanted to surprise you with by bringing out here to be a part of this conversation. I'll have to go upside down for that. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, he flipped upside down That's for that. That's nice. <laughs> uh, so hello, Robbie. Uh, Fresh Life, welcome, Robbie, uh, Shane's wife. Hello. And look at him upside down like a bat. He's Smiling. hanging like... Yep. Oh, that's amazing. Aww. We just thought while uh, while Shane's away for six months, and thank you, Robbie, for your sacrifice you. and all of that, uh, we would have you out to Montana. Our plan was a spa day for you, but instead <laughs> we dragged you through the woods and got you nice it and sweaty. It was the best. I, want, I prefer that so much more. So sweaty and dirty. Got to and hang with the family. You brought us some NASA swag, of which I've got one of Shane's patches here. That's awesome. And, and so I thought we'd have you together just for a moment because when we were with you guys for the launch, which was the last time we were together, mm -hmm. We got to be uh, at the Wave Across event where mm -hmm. Shane gets to be with the family from a little bit of a distance. Mm -hmm. You're quarantined with him, of course. Right. And then we all had a prayer and, and a, a song. And I just, you're, just your emotional reaction to all that. Oh, my. Well, Jenny, thanks to Jenny, because she, she started the worship. I mean, we were all kind of just dumbfounded and, and just seeing all the family in one room together at the hangar, the SpaceX hangar. And Jenny just, you know, spontaneously started to sing and praise God. And it's what we needed in that moment. And y'all being there and just uh, with all the family and being able to worship and praise God right before Zach, or Shane went to do all this. It was, it was exactly what was needed in the moment. And we could not have asked for something better. It was awesome. So thank Shane, you what too. was that experience yeah. like for you there, that moment, that, that singing that Waymaker song? Uh, it was incredible. It was just the whole event was emotional because and I'd been through it uh, and I just knew how special those moments are with uh, your loved ones and family right there in front of you about 10 feet away um, and then of course like Robbie said when Jenny started singing it it was you know <laughs> it was just an emotional moment um, I think Robbie and I were holding hands and we just started squeezing each other um, very tight and really hold on to that that one last kind of moment together as we worship together. Wow, and I know Robbie has in her hands yeah. a book that you have up there in space as well, yeah. a devotional, the, the Focus Life. I was curious just for a moment, Shane, what, what is the experience like staying connected? Because I, I know you guys are planning your daughter daughter's wedding, Taylor's getting married in November, uh, which I was curious, Shane, what is more nerve-wracking, a spacewalk or the thought of walking your daughter down the aisle? Uh, yet to be seen. This will be my first. Um, but, uh, it's, yeah, I think it's going to be, it's obviously going to be a special moment, and uh, we'll have to see if I can hold it together or not. And your daughter um, is, uh, is one of your three children, of course. You guys have Caitlin and Taylor and Zach, all amazing kids. Mm -hmm. So maybe just, Shane, could you speak to, for a moment to staying connected? Because not everybody's going to deal with space travel, but everybody deals with distance. Mm -hmm. So, Shane, how do you stay connected to your wife? How do you stay connected with your kids when your your job takes you literally 250 miles up? Yeah, we I would say we have it pretty good up here, honestly. Uh, I get to talk to Robbie every day. Um, I call her on the phone every day. We get to chat and just stay in touch. So that's really important for our relationship, for one. Um, and then just for her to keep me up to date with whatever is going on on planet Earth as well. Uh, our kids, we get to video chat once a week. So usually on Saturdays or Sundays, we'll get a chance to do a video chat with everybody. So with Robbie and all of our kids on the same screen for me, no matter, even though they're all in different cities, um, NASA does a great job of pulling them all together so we can all be, be together for about an hour or so every weekend. And then usually during the week, I'll get a chance to call the kids, you know, once or twice on top of that to stay connected with them. They're all very busy. They're all in school right now. And, uh, but it's still great to stay in touch with them and, and just you know kind of be connected. And that's really special. And again, we have really great technology up here to allow us to do, to do that. I know folks in the military don't have near this capability and people that are getting deployed all the time. And so I feel for them even more for, for many reasons, but uh, one is the connectivity that we're really um, blessed to have up here. Anything you'd add on that? No, I mean, it just, it does our heart so much good to be able to just see his face once a week and just show him the dog and the backyard and just the house and the normal life and all of that. So, and, and all the family being on the screen together, um, just, it's good for us. And it's so yeah. cool that you guys are reading the same yeah. and we're, That's right, yes, and that y'all gave us. Yeah, we, everybody's got this. I, I think we're, we're close on the same days, but it's nice that we can reference the Psalms and the Proverbs and, and the different things that we can do together. Incredible. That you guys gave us. So, so cool. Well, yeah. Shane, thank you. Robbie, thank you. On behalf of our whole church family, I would love if I could just say a prayer for you guys. Uh, we're grateful for what you're doing. It matters. I hope everybody in our church family will get the ISS tracker app where you can see this space station go by with a naked eye on a dark evening and 
think and pray for the safety of everybody aboard. And we're really, really grateful for what you guys are doing. Every single person on the space station and at NASA sacrificing to make this possible, to extend the borders of possibility, all the important experiments you're doing, and everything that God's doing through you guys. Thank you, Levi, and thank you, Fresh Life. Well, Father, thank you for Shane. <clears throat> thank you for his spirit, his heart. Thank you for his mind and yes. everybody uh, aboard the space station serving from the different countries and the way it's a picture of heaven. Every tribe, tongue, language, and nation represented yes. in your kingdom. And there on the space station, all these different countries and space agencies coming together. And we do pray for your hand to be continually upon it and upon every single astronaut and yes. cosmonaut up there. And we pray for you to bring them safely back home to their families. Thank you for the work that they're doing, and thank you for the way that it reminds us all to look up. And we pray for your hand to be upon Robbie and their family uh, through the rest of the mission until you bring Shane back to them. And we just thank you for the, the faith that links us up together. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thanks again. I got to do another one for you. Awesome. Yeah, come on. A flip on the way out. Thank you so much, Shane. Come on. Let's hear it. Can we get up for Shane one more time and Robbie Kimbrough? Shane and Robbie, we love you. What a privilege, what a pleasure. Now this is all a part of this conversation, these 35 days of hope. And we spent much of last week in the story of Joseph and walking through what hope looked like when he found himself in the pit. And in that pit, he made the decision to not stare at the pit he was in, but to lift his eyes and to look up and to keep his heart centered on God, even when for the next years, years, his life was full of pain and betrayal. And even when it looked like he was about to get out, being forgotten about and how easy it would be to be, to be disillusioned. And as we move into the second week now, uh, talking about what it means to look up in hard times, we're moving our attention to David. And David, like Shane is experiencing in space, and like you and I are all going to face in life, dealt with times where he felt isolated, where he felt all alone, and maybe, just maybe, he felt panic creeping in to his heart. I can't imagine what it must feel like at times, even though I know Shane uh, is incredibly grateful for the opportunity, but to have that feeling of, I can't get out of here even if I want to. And that kind of like terror that would at times maybe show up in the midst of a night's sleep. I know David sure felt like that. When he was a young man, a prophet came to his family's farm and singled him out out of all of his siblings. And he had a lot better looking, buffer, braver brothers. And out of all those boys, the prophet chose him. He wasn't even included. His dad didn't even think the opposite of Joseph. He was the anti-Joseph where Joseph's dad doted on him the most for being uh, younger. Uh, David's dad didn't even include him when the prophet was going to pick a king out of his, his boys. David wasn't even invited to, to be at the table or in the conversation, meaning his dad didn't even think that he was king material. But David didn't care. He was just happy to do his job and to take care of those sheep. And when a bear would attack him, he would beat the bear down. When, he didn't have bear spray or anything. He just <laughs> took the bear down with his bare hands and slingshot. It's just amazing. He just had this heart to put himself in, 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 in harm's way to take care of those sheep. That's how seriously he took his job. The same when a lion would come. And then a servant came and said, David, your dad needs you. There's a prophet. None of your brothers have been picked. They want to, he wants to see you. Just shows you that if you just keep your, your heart on what God's got in front of you right now, when God wants to exalt you, he knows how to come and get you where you are. You're not out of his sight. You're not, I, I just, my life has been proof of that. I remember one of the, if I'm honest with you for a moment, I hope I'm always honest with you, but if I'm just lay myself bare, lay, lay myself bare for a little bit, when God first called Jenny and I uh, years ago, these now almost 15 years ago, the dream of moving to Montana and start Fresh Life Church, we at the time were ministering in Southern California and God was doing things through our lives that we were looking at going, this feels like what we dreamt about when we were young. This, this feels like what we've been called to do. We were preaching at events and lots and lots of people would come. And when I first thought, God, are you calling us to move and start this thing called Fresh Life in Montana? The rational side of my brain said, Levi, you've been called to reach a lot of people. There are not a lot of people in that state. So it just doesn't make sense. A wise voice spoke into my life and said, this is not God's will. There are more cows than people in Montana. 
And so why would you move away from opportunity, move away from what God's doing when it doesn't seem like that makes sense? And I couldn't argue with the logic, but I couldn't deny the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. You are called to do a, reach a lot of people and move to Montana. And how that's going to work, I don't know. And, and we've just watched God uh, open doors and create opportunities without us trying to make them happen. Just be faithful in, with what's in front of us. And it always makes us marvel when we get to look up and go, oh my gosh, this, this, this chance, this opportunity. And, and God just does his thing. That's David's story. Just taking care of the sheep. Now he's being anointed to become king. And his brothers are all looking on like, what in the heck? Just like the world's going to look on. When as you continue to do what God called you to do, he finds you. He promotes you. He blesses you. He gives you more than you deserve. I'm just telling you, that's our God. So don't leave the sheep. That's the sermon. Don't leave the sheep. Just stay with the sheep. Do what you're called to do with all your heart. You take care of that, that little classroom. You take care of that little opportunity. You do that, 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 what feels like a little thing right now, but you just keep doing it. That Etsy shop, that YouTube channel, that thing you're working on. I'm just telling you, you just do it with all your heart. And you watch God just continue to, to weave and, 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 and move and, and change and bless. Well, now David's anointed. Y'all, he has the oily clothes to prove it, right? Oil ran down his head. That's how they got kings ready for their assignment. And he's sort of thinking like, well, what's a king going to do next? And pretty soon his dad said, hey, David, I think those sheep are hungry. Oh. And you know what he did? Went back straight to the sheep. And there he was when his brothers were off fighting a war that David didn't even get to be a soldier in. And his dad said, hey, David, your brothers, the soldiers, are hungry. I need you to bring them some cheese and bring them some bread. And he's like, oh, cool. I'm the king, AKA pizza delivery boy. And David said, cool. How much do you want me to take? Where are they going to be? And while there, his brother's fighting this battle, uh, this giant starts making fun of God, starts making fun of Israel. And David says, is anybody going to do anything about that? And they said, well, the king says he'll. He'll bless anybody who does. He goes, well, I can't let God be talked about that way. So he goes and does the same thing to the giant that he did to the lion and the bear. You see, he didn't know when the bear attacked the sheep that he was in training for a fight that he didn't even know was coming. But had he not been faithful back then when no one was watching in the field, he wouldn't have had the confidence to face the giant with the entire army watching. We are always in training. Everything's a test. Training never ends. It builds. Shane was faithful in the helicopter desert storm and didn't know how that would impact later opportunities, open up other doors. When he was a little boy, he had the dream planted of being an astronaut. Listen to YouTube this week. I did a conversation with Robbie privately. What's it like to be an astronaut's wife? That's the real question, right? We need to hear more from Robbie. And she's going to talk about, yeah, that's amazing. You're doing a spacewalk. I'm doing laundry. And how do we have the right heart? Because this whole thing, what, what astronauts mentality and thinking, how does it apply to life on Earth? And I like the juxtaposition of the moment we're in. Because civilians just got back from space, four of them, Jared and Dr. Proctor and Chris and Haley, this, this Inspiration4 mission, doing what has kind of been the thing ever since Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, who, by the way, was a civilian. And everyone sort of forgets that. Oh, civilians have never been. Well, the first guy to walk on the moon was. And I love the idea that normal people can do this stuff. And I love that God does want to work through your life. And God has great plans for you. And so David discovered that if you're faithful, God will just keep opening up more opportunities. But don't let your big dreams keep you from little jobs. Done well with all your heart to give God the credit. Even after Goliath is dead, you're thinking, dude, king me, right? That's what you're thinking. You're thinking, king me. But instead, the opposite happens. David began to be hunted by the king who grew jealous of him, even though David never wanted to do anything but help the king, never wanted to do anything but bless the king. But Saul launches on this massive, massive smear campaign to discredit David and to hurt David. And soon David has to leave his home and go on the run. And he ends up, Joseph was in a pit. David ends up in a cave. And there in the cave, he was presented with opportunity after opportunity to kill Saul. Because Saul, as a, it's like almost like a 
it's the scene out of a John Grisham novel, okay? Like Harrison Ford and Tommy Lee Jones. It's like, it's a manhunt. And, and now he's in this position where he could kill Saul who was hunting him because he was hiding in the back of a cave and Saul came to take a nap in the cave. And, and David's friends, his, he's got this bad, like Sons of Anarchy crew who's rolling deep with him. And they're like, we're your ride or die, bro. And when they see Saul, they're like, dude, you go slit that punk's throat, right? Two in the chest, one in the head. This, this cat's got to go down. And David says, I will not sin against God. There's not a greater test I can imagine. You know how Joseph had the chance to give revenge on all his brothers? So did David here. And I think it's a great test when we're given a, a shot like that. What will we do? David says, God wouldn't be pleased with it. God wouldn't be blessed by that. I will not lift my hand against someone that God appointed. And he did not take Saul's life that day or the next time the same thing happened. You see, my, my point in all of this is just like Shane was in training for missions that were going to come, and, and even his first space shuttle mission, it was just a temporary assignment. They called it the Extreme Makeover Space Edition because their job was to bring another bathroom and to bring uh, a, a, another module for the gym up. And he was just going to stay there for a little while. He was sleeping in the space shuttle and then go back home. He had no idea he would get another mission. And when he got the next mission, it would be a six-month assignment where he would live in the house he had been working on. He thought, I'm doing this for other astronauts. It turned out it benefited him. Isn't that so cool? So two hours a day, he's working to, do, to deal with the effects of microgravity on the human body, which is really devastating for the body unless you counter effect it. So that's why he works out two hours a day so he doesn't come home shriveled and anemic and sickly and with his bones deteriorated and losing all kind of muscle mass. And so, but every time he's doing a set of bench press on that special machine that he works out on, which I can tell you does not involve weights. It's all magnets because it would weigh nothing. Look, yeah, 900 pounds, dog, right? <laughs> It's all like magnets. It's super fascinating to me, as you can tell. Contain yourself, Levi. But he's, he's doing it on a gym he thought he installed for somebody else. Give your life away, and in so doing, you will find it. We never know when we're being measured for a larger opportunity in God's hand. And David, throughout all these things, and I'll just bring this to a, a landing because you're going to get to spend it all week long in, in this devotional if you have it. And if you look at, on the Fresh Life reading plans on version, if you don't have it yet, joining on TV or wherever you can get it and join us in this soap journal journey through 35 Days of Hope, David comes out of this thing. And as God promised, he is anointed and appointed king over all Israel. Second Samuel chapter 4 and 5, a full 20 seven years after that day in 1 Samuel 16, when the oil ran down his brow. There was a space between. What do we do when there's a space between promise and fulfillment? No, you might not get to the space station. I might not get to Mars, all right? Maybe, maybe you can. If you have a billion dollars, please buy me a seat. I would love to come with you. Uh, but let me say this. We might not get to space, but we all deal with the space between promise and fulfillment, a dream given and a dream realized. And in those days, we have to remember there's purpose in it. That's what it feels like sometimes, crazy and purposeless, and God's forgotten. And where, 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 what's happening here? The space between has a purpose, and the purpose is for you to be developed so that when the dream's realized, it doesn't crush you. Listen to me carefully. If the light that's on you is, is brighter than the light inside of you, it will destroy you. And at times, the reason God doesn't allow us instantly to get to what we are qualified for by our gift today is because he knows that your gifts can take you to places where your character can't sustain you. And had David been given the crown that he was destined for when he was in 1 Samuel 16, perhaps he would have become a king like Saul and not been a man after God's own heart who would do all of his will. It was the cave days that formed and forged in him the kind of character and integrity that he would need down the line. And then just to be completely pragmatic, some of the best songs ever written have been written in the darkest places. See also the book of Psalms, which Shane and Robbie and their kids 
have in that beautiful little leather-bound book we were able to give him. And that is this, psalm after psalm after psalm was David pouring out his heart because his life was hurting so much. So here's a practical application for the sermon. Are you hurting today? Sing songs. Are you weary today? Turn to God. That's what David did. I wanted to read to you a portion of one of Shane's favorite psalms. I emailed him and I said, hey, what, what psalm is your favorite of David's? I'd love to read one in your honor on this day. He said immediately, Psalm 37. And in Psalm 37, he was wrestling with the idea of people who seem like they're evil doing really well, while people who are trying to be like good in their life, like getting crapped on all the time by circumstances. And he, if you've ever, have you ever felt like that? This isn't a church where you have to pretend like everything's okay. It's okay to feel sometimes like life's crapping on you, all right? And sometimes it really does. And David was struggling with that when he wrote, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall sh soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness. I'm speaking this over you today as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from your anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. What does it do? It only causes harm. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. I have been young and now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends, and his descendants are blessed. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Would David have had the perspective and seasoning in his soul to be capable of such words had it not been for the incredible difficulty that he faced in this 27 year long period where he dealt with what you're facing today, many of you, the space between. And so to me, the invitation for us that, that Shane has to live out when the space station goes tumbling, can you even imagine out of control, loses verbal communication with Houston. And they calmly come together and formulate a plan, even though every single one of them know there's a possibility of having to, to, to be jettisoned out in a, in a capsule, a life raft. I mean, just all, but, but staying calm and talking and sticking to the plan and remembering the training. And that's the power of his hiding God's word in his heart and his personal devos and staying connected with his family. And by the way, how challenging was that? I talked to my wife every day and I talked to my kids every single week. I'm like, goodness gracious. Some of us are like, we're doing well if we do, even on earth, not in space, uh, do that. And, and so that's amazingly challenging. But, but all of those things that he's doing on a regular basis, watching church each week, being grounded in a community, the song tucked in his heart, for, for the launch and the way that was ringing out still in his actions in those moments, all of these things we can apply. You're dealing with craziness. Your, your life is wild, but you can choose to hide God's word in your heart. You can choose to make sure you're working hard to prioritize staying in sync with your family. And I know in the YouTube video on Wednesday, we'll talk with Robbie about, it actually can be more challenging when he gets home. Soldiers deal with PTSD after they get home. When life's really crazy, it can be in the calm moments later on that you start to feel what you were doing in those days and the body keeps score and all of those things. But we can choose to learn to put these things into, 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 into action. And the invitation is to hope. And I love that when we read this from David, we know that he went through things where he didn't know exactly what was going to happen next. Hope isn't you saying, I know what this is going to look like as I keep following God. Hope is just saying, I know that God knows. Yes. This is not some formula. This is not an ATM machine. We're not promising you, you put your hope journal in the machine and push these buttons and here's exactly what's going to come out. This, this is messy and in real time, it's frustrating. Y'all, I'm standing in a room I have shed thousands of tears in 
We, we, we are speaking this in, in the room where we had my daughter's funeral. So this is not some message preached in some pie in the sky. It, it could hurt someday. I'm telling you, sometimes it hurts like hell, but hope works there too. Hope shines there too. And in the cave and in the pit and in the, the, the reality of being on a broken planet with a fragile atmosphere, it's declaring that we have a glorious God who is still king and his son defeated the power of the grave when he rose up on the third day. And so we can sit and say, I will not fret, I will not fear, because what will that do? I love what David said. Do not fret, it only causes harm. How can you make yourself taller by worrying? Can you color the change of your hair by stressing? No, you can't. But our God sits as king. And so hope says, I don't know why God would let this happen. I don't know what he has planned. But God, come what may, I will follow you. I will worship you. And our simple decision to not fret and to hold on to peace and to believe in the power of the confidence of a brighter tomorrow, that's hope. It's an act of defiance in the face of the chaos that at times sits there in front of us, taunting us. So we will choose to look up, to set our minds and our hearts and our attention and our focus on things that we cannot see with the naked eye. And I believe, especially for those of you whose hearts are heavy, who are dealing with grief today, who are wondering where's God in your situation today, the pain of divorce, the pain of sickness, the pain of abandonment, someone who's betrayed you or really hurt you, this is the perfect place to hold hope. This is the, the ground zero for us to look up and to rebuild better and to rebuild stronger. And we're going to be smarter. And we're going to be better versions of ourselves because of these things. And I believe that hope's invitation in the cave, and that's where we're at this week. We're in the cave, fine. In that space between, we have the chance to say, God, you're developing me. So when you bring me on the other side, I'm, I, I cherish, I choose to cherish this brutality because of who it's making me to be, what you're doing in it. You didn't send the evil, let's be clear, but you're sure as heck going to override it and overwhelm it. And what man meant for evil, I dare you to believe, God, you're going to use this for good. Two invitations as we close this worship experience. And what an honor. What a day. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here as my day is, has been made. My life has been made. This is amazing. And all the excitement moving forward to January. And I can't wait to, to talk to you more about that. It's going to just, it's going to be awesome. I'm, I'm so excited. But two invitations. First is an invitation, a chant for anybody to say today, I feel a bit like David Levi. The isolation, the loneliness, the fear. I, mean, I feel like I'm about ready to do something foolish. Because we can all get out of the cave somehow or other. If, if David cut that, that, that king's neck, he'd have got out of that cave. But he refused to. So this is a chance for you to go, I, I feel like killing myself. <laughs> or I'm just tempted to do something dumb. Or I'm just fretting today. I want to give you a space and time to, in the presence of the Lord to admit that. Church Online, every single one of you, I believe God is sending this message right into your situation in Boston and in Rhode Island and in, or is that the same place? No, that's Massachusetts. In, in Rhode Island and, and wherever else you might be, Portland and Salt Lake City and, and all across the world and hi, beyond the world. I got to remember to start throwing that in every once in a while. I, I tempt, I'm tempted to forget. Um, the second invitation goes to anybody today and you're here Maybe you heard astronaut, you're big on space, and NASA and all the stuff, or you just bought a shirt at Urban Outfitters and so you kind of look like you are into it. And you're here not quite so sure about this Jesus thing. And I, I just wanted to quickly speak to the invitation that's in the gospel for anybody to come to Christ. Not just people who are religious people or Jesus people. If you are breathing, God loves you. Jesus died for you on the cross. He rose from the dead on your behalf. He wants to put power into your casket, hope inside your soul to bring you out of the grave, to give you life while you're living here on this earth. And I love, one of the things I love today is we're, we're in the Japanese module, by the way, the, the, that we were in. 
And all these wires, one of the things I wanted to ask Shane that I forgot to was, do you really know what all those wires do? It's like when I look into a cockpit, I want to ask a pilot, like, do you know what any of that means? You know what I'm saying? Like, do you know any of those? Oh, that button right there. What does that one do? Aha, <laughs> busted, right? I wanted to ask Shane, like, what is, and I had him uh, with the water that he was going to float the water out and drink it. But the 25 minutes that NASA approved the satellite time for just went like that. Um, but what I, one of the things I love about this is, is we're seeing a false dichotomy torn down. And the false dichotomy goes like this. If I want to follow God, I have to leave my mind at the door. And science and faith are incompatible. And let me just tell you something. That is not true. In fact, John Glenn, the very first American to ever orbit the Earth, ever, 1962, John Glenn, who got at the age of 77 to go back to space on the shuttle, becoming at that time the oldest American to ever go to space. Then Wally Funk sort of destroyed that when she went up for her 15 minutes with Bezos. Uh, but John Glenn, when he got back to Earth and was asked about the experience, about what it did to be in outer space or inner space, going to low Earth orbit in his capsule as a person of faith. And I think the question inherent is like, do you still believe in God when you go to space, right? And being a scientist and being a part, like, what does that do to your Christian worldview? And here's what he had to say, and I quote, he said, to look at this creation and not believe in God, to me, is impossible. Going to space at 77, he said, has just strengthened my faith. And so I just want to tell you today, if a barrier to you to believe in God is sort of thinking that, that that somehow doesn't work with science and somehow doesn't work with space and doesn't, somehow doesn't work with, with intelligence, nothing could be further from the truth. But there also uh, is to those who would say, like, I, I, I don't need to be saved because I'm so good or I've, I've lived such a good life. That's what I'm hoping for. I don't believe in the idea of sin. We've, we've, we've grown beyond that. I would just say you must not have children, all right? Because <laughs> I'm just telling you, we don't have to teach our kids to sin. They do it really well all on their own. And I think as, if we're honest with ourselves, every one of us has a sense of guilt, have a sense of I have hurt, I have done wrong. And so here's, here's what God has done. It's, it's amazing to leave earth and, and go up. That's awesome. But how about God who sent his son Jesus down to save us from our sin, to save us from ourselves? And when he rose from the dead on the third day, and that stands, the resurrection of Jesus, as a historical fact that very, very few people who have looked into it with even a mind to destroy the, the, the credibility of, of such an assertion have ever been able to walk away without absolutely shaking their head at the preponderance of data that exists to support the, the, the statement that Jesus Christ came to this world 2,000 years ago. He died on the cross and he was seen by his followers many different times on many different days after the fact. And they walked away from the experience prepared to go to their deaths believing that Christ had risen from the dead when they gained nothing for such a belief. And so here's the invitation. If you've never given your heart to Christ, today's the day. Now's the time. Let him come into your heart and change your life and forgive you of your sins and give you the hope of heaven and peace while you live here below. Will you pray with me? So firstly, Father, to those who are hurting today, thank you that there's hope. Not certainty of what it's going to look like, but hope in you, in the living God who raises the dead. If you're here and you would say, I'm in a, I'm in a cave, I'm hurting, I'm lonely today, I'm isolated today, I'm, I'm worried today, would you raise your hand up, letting God know? Just raise a hand up. I feel like a bit like David today, and I want some songs to come out of this season. Thank you, Jesus, for these. Bless them. May your favor, like the oil that ran down David's head, run upon them today your spirit in their lives. May they feel like they are not alone, for they are not. You could put your hands down. And now all around the world, if you're here and you would say, I want to give my life to Jesus today. I want to be saved from my sin. Today's my day. I want to say a prayer, and I want you to pray it with me, because the Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. So let me give you language, not as some sort of magic password, but just your way of articulating that you believe that you receive, 
that you were dead, now you're alive in Christ. Church family, pray it with us, but if you're making this decision, say this out loud right there in your living room, every single location, let God hear you. Let yourself hear you. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I've done wrong things. I can't, for, I can't fix that. I can't change that. But I believe you can because your son Jesus died for me and you raised him from the dead. So thank you for new life. I give you mine. Now with head still bowed and eyes still closed, in a moment I'm gonna, I'm gonna count down from five. It's gonna be a little bit of a countdown. And when I get to one, if you just gave your heart to Jesus, either dedicating your life to him for the first time or perhaps as a rededication, the prodigal son coming home, I want you to shoot your hand up in the air, raise it up high. This is your way of saying, this is real, this has just happened. I just decided to follow Jesus. When I get to one, just shoot your hand up right there in your living room, right there in the, the gym on the Stairmaster. Just shoot that hand up when I get to one. God sees you. You are not alone. You are not orphaned. You are loved. He wants to use you to change this world. Four, three, two, one. Raise your hands up. Raise your hands up. Raise your hands up. We are celebrating in the room, across the church, across the world. You can put your hands down. We are so excited for this decision that you've made. Amen.